So um, again, why, why is the nutrition of the young growing horse so important? I, I, I tell people basically when the horse is growing, you have that period of growth to get it right and you can't go back and fix it. You know, if, if you mess up on nutrition during the growth phase, when your horse is 10, you can't go back and fix something that happened due to a nutrient imbalance or a nutrient deficiency back when it was, you know, a yearling. So it's very important to get it right while they're growing. Now that while they are growing, I do want to mention that, for instance, if you go and buy a weanling or a, a yearling even, there, even if the nutrition has not been optimal before you got it, as long as the horse is still growing, you can see if you, if you get the nutrition right at that point, moving on, uh, sometimes you can kind of correct for earlier imbalances. I'm not going to say always, but sometimes you can. And one of the things, proper nutrition will help the individual grow to their genetic potential. And improper nutrition can truly stunt a horse's growth, but there is something called compensatory growth. For instance, a horse, as I mentioned, if, if the horse was not receiving adequate nutrition before it, became, it came into your hands and you fix that and you provide them proper nutrition through the rest of their growing phase, you can see compensatory growth and these, these late growth spurts where the horse is finally getting the nutrient it needs and then can grow to their genetic potential, which is probably one of the reasons my horse at age five, then um, I got it at four and really increased its plane of nutrition and saw that, in, that unexpected extra inch that I really wasn't looking for, but yes, all good. Uh, so it's important because in general, we're talking about horses that we wanna be future equine athletes. You want all the building blocks so that you have proper bone and uh, muscle development. Uh, it's very important while they're growing because we do have periods of very rapid skeletal growth. And when they're growing fast, if they're not getting the nutrients that they need to support that growth, you can run into big problems. Minerals are being deposited in bone at that time. And actually there is remodeling and remineral demineralization and remineralization of the skeleton throughout the growth period in different phases. So you always wanna make sure that everything is there to help support that, that process. And if there's poor nutrient intake, you're gonna end up with poor skeletal development and that will reduce, result in reduced performance potential. And I'm not sure why, but my, my little dog is over there complaining at me. So if you hear little woofs in the background, that is Olivia telling me she's unhappy with me about something, but. Life is tough, I'm not gonna play with her right now. Okay, one of the things with equine growth, um, when you compare horses within the livestock industry to other livestock species, breeding horses is very different from breeding other production animals. Um, horses are, usually, are bred for some type of performance, whether that performance is uh, athletic, sporting performance, it, they may be, um, bred to become breeding horses, but for the most part, horses are bred to have a job and they're not bred for meat, milk, fiber, and also for horses, when we breed horses, we're also looking for longevity. In, in livestock production, longevity is not usually the goal. We want healthy, uh, sound, long-lived animals, and that's our goal. Um, it's a little tricky when dealing with horses because with that in mind, the measure of production is quite ambiguous. With other livestock species, they measure rate of growth. They measure average daily gain. They, they can actually measure muscle mass. And so there are absolute measures of production. When you're in the dairy industry, they measure milk production. In the horse industry, how do we measure if we're getting the best average daily gain out of our young growing horse. It's again, much more nebulous. So there are some tools we can use, but we have to realize that we're, we're not keeping track as well as, as they do in the other livestock industries. In horses, in general, high growth rates are undesirable. We don't want to grow the horse too fast. 
but realistically, some breeds have very, you know, they're, they're fast growers. So we have to realize that and we have to know the tools we can use to adjust and to control those horses' growth rates. And of course, horses are not selected for feed conversion efficiency or muscling, because again, those are not the things that we're looking for. We're looking for performance and um, longevity. So balanced growth to help us ensure that our horses do grow strong, grow healthy, and, and are sound and healthy for a very long time, we need to make sure that they have good balanced growth and providing proper nutrition is essential for that type of growth. Now, as I said, um, I'm, I'm starting early in feeding horses because I'm actually starting before the horse is born because the fetus actually needs to get proper nutrition to start, you know, to hit the ground with a, a good solid base. And so it's important to realize how the fetus is growing during gestation. And if you look at this chart, months of gestation versus the, the fetal weight, the majority of the fetal growth actually occurs during the last 90 days of gestation. So that last three months, that fetus is just going to town, growing inside the mare. So it's really, really, really important during at least the last 90 days of gestation that you're feeding the mare not only to maintain herself, but to provide the nutrients to support that vast fetal growth going on. So again, fetal growth is not linear. At, during the first seven months of pregnancy, the fetus is growing, but really not very slowly. And when you talk about pregnant mare nutrition, for the first six to seven months, quite often people are told that you can feed the mare basically as if she was at maintenance because you don't have to feed significantly more to support the fetus. But once they hit that last four to five months, you see how that line, it's been kind of steady and low, and then suddenly it just drastically goes up because that's when the fetus is really growing. So those last months, it's critical to get the nutrients. They need the zinc, manganese, iron, copper. They need all of the, the enzymes to help provide as the skeletal system is growing, the organs are growing. They also need all the other nutrients. They need calories. Uh, they need protein and amino acids. And this is the time that it's, it's so important to make sure that the mare is getting adequate nutrition to support this fetal growth. It's also important for the mare's total plane of nutrition to be gradually increasing because once that baby is grown, the mare's energy requirements, for instance, almost double to supply the, the energy, the calories for milk production as well as the other nutrients, protein, vitamins, and minerals, because the mare is going to be putting all this nutrition into the milk from the, for the baby. And you want to support that baby's early growth. And you also want to support the mare so that she doesn't just drain her own stores and get very thin and unhealthy because number one, she needs to still support the baby. And number two, you may want to be breeding her back again. So you get a baby again next year. So make sure you support the mare throughout the pregnancy. So now you got a baby hitting the ground. Some interesting growth facts about um, the growth of these, these uh, foals, these young babies from the beginning. At birth, they are at 10% of their mature weight and they're 60% of their mature height. So think about that. They're, they're already at 60% of mature height. But then at six months, they go up to 80% of their mature height, but they go from 10% of their weight to 50% of their mature weight. So that baby is just a growing machine. If you think about it from a human perspective, uh, that would mean at six months old, think, think about a little six month old, that's basically a toddler. You got a toddler that's four and a half feet tall and 156 pounds. That would make you some really bad, terrible twos, wouldn't it? Because if they're that big at six months, whoa. So anyhow, again, this baby is just growing really fast. And when we look at this baby that is growing so fast, 
the rate of gain actually can become an issue. If the baby is growing too fast and exceeding that individual's optimal rate of gain, it can run you into problems. So now you notice here on this growth curve, we've got month of age on the, on, on the X axis and weight on the Y axis. And so we've got three different growth curves. We've got a rapid growth rate, an a moderate growth rate, and a slow growth rate. I'm not gonna say any of these are unhealthy, but you've got to recognize your own baby's growth rate and adjust to make sure that you're feeding to support that growth rate. We start seeing problems when, for instance, the baby's at a rapid growth rate and they may be getting one nutrient that supports the rapid growth rate and not all of the nutrients. So it's got to be balanced to support whatever growth rate is appropriate and optimal for your you know, growing individual. Um, quarter horses, we tend to want a moderate growth rate. Some of these great big breeds that are still gonna be mature at age four or five, and they're going to be you know, 17 plus hands in the same amount of time, you're gonna see a, ra a more rapid growth rate just because they've got further to go in about the same amount of time. Again, you gotta recognize, you gotta adjust, and what we're looking for is consistency in that growth rate. We want a nice smooth curve. We don't want dips. We don't want big bumps in it because the dips and bumps are when you start seeing bone developmental orthopedic uh, disorders in these young growing horses. And those can be problems that can end up being long-term problems. Now, do we feed for a slower growth rate? And if you, Olivia, stop barking at me. If you, if you feed for a slower growth rate, that's fine, um, but you still need to feed properly to support good growth. And one of the big things that you can do to slow down a, a young growing horse's growth rate is cut the calories. When we reduce calories, they grow slower. And quite often, if a young growing horse is running into some of these DODs, the first recommendation is, for instance, pull all the grain away from the young horse and just feed hay. Well, that certainly does cut calories, but that cuts a lot of other essential nutrients. And in those situations, we can see them slow down their growth rate, but they still may have all sorts of bone disorders because they're not getting the nutrients to support proper, proper growth. So when that kind of thing happens, I'll get into it a little bit more later, but my recommendation is to slow down or reduce the total caloric density of the program. You don't wanna reduce the protein, vitamins and minerals, but instead of cutting out the grain, maybe go to a, a lower calorie grain, cut the total amount of forage and grain, uh, cut out the grain and go to a ration balance. Or there are a lot of things to cut calories, but still provide all of the essential nutrients. So again, you want a balanced diet because you want to meet all of the nutrient requirements for growth. So in this chart just kind of shows, uh, we're gonna get into a little bit more into developmental orthopedic disorders or disease. And you can see from this one, on the x-axis, we've got the growth rate. We have slow to the left and fast to the right. And then on the y-axis, we have problems. So if you have a slow growth rate, you tend to have few problems. If you have a very fast growth rate, um, you can have you know, a lot of problems. Uh, if you get too slow, you get into retarded growth and you have problems. So the optimal growth rate, I don't know if you can see my little arrow if that shows up. Oh, well, that did not work. <laughs> so I won't use my arrow. Okay, you can see the optimal growth is kind of right there in the middle. It's not too slow. It's not too fast. You don't want retarded growth. You don't want DD, DODs. You get too much in the retarded growth and you're going to get stunted growth and the baby's not going to grow to its genetic potential. So you want to find that nice middle ground, optimal growth for your individual. Again, that depends on the breed. It depends on your horse. To some extent, it depends on how tall that the horse is genetically you know, programmed to become um, and, and find that optimal growth rate. So how do you find the optimal growth rate? 
Well, one of the big things to just get the optimal growth rate is you've got to balance the diet. So I look at it as, okay, for, on one side of the, of the scale, you've got the energy or the calories. How many calories does it take to be, maintain your young horse at an appropriate size? And we're going to get just about every presentation I do, I get into body condition scoring because that's what's going to tell you if your horse is getting the right amount of calories. So the calories are primarily coming from the soluble carbs in the diet, from the fiber in the diet, and from the fat in the diet. So your calories kind of are that's the, the amount, the total amount of, of feed and forage providing the calories to maintain appropriate weight for your horse as it's growing. Now, on the other side of the balancing act is energy determines how much, and then within the amount to provide the right number of calories, you need to be sure that the protein, vitamins, and minerals are in that total ration to support the nutrient requirements. So that's the balancing act. We got the energy here and then we got to balance it and make sure we're getting the right amount of protein, vitamins and minerals within that amount of feed. So hopefully that makes sense. So how do you determine the energy? Body condition scoring. And body condition scoring for young growing horses is pretty much the same as for mature horses. You look at the same places on the body. The one caveat is when you have a very young horse, it's not as frightening to see a few ribs. In, in fact, for a very young baby, it's, it's, it may be advantageous to just kind of see the outline of the last few ribs. And a lot of times in babies, they're going along, the, the ribs are just covered, you have them just where you want them to be, and then you suddenly see some ribs and you say, oh, there's a growth spurt. So you adjust the diet, to make sure you're gonna bump up maybe a, little, a, a few more calories, make sure again, protein, vitamins and minerals are in there to support and make sure that that baby is getting what it needs. And then of course, cover the ribs, but don't let them get fat. Just monitor all the time. You do wanna see a young growing horse stay at about a body condition score five. If you keep them at a body condition score five throughout their growth phase, you're going to have pretty consistent and a pretty nice smooth growth curve. So of course our goal in feeding these grow, growing horses is sound growth and development. So nutrition, some things people tend to think is um, high protein may be a problem causing skeletal abnormalities. This is a myth, that is not true at all. High protein, the worst thing that happens with a little too much protein is there's some excess nitrogen from amino acid breakdown. Uh, they drink some water, they flush the water out in the urine. It's not a risk. Low protein, insufficient protein definitely is a risk. And so I'm, I'm much more concerned about making sure the baby gets adequate protein. Now, when it, within protein, it's not specifically, you know, the percent of protein, that's crude protein. It's really more about amino acid balance. And we'll talk a little bit more about amino acid balance in a moment. Um, excess calories and lack of nutritional balance does increase risk of, of uh, DODs and poor growth and development. So we're back to balancing calories with the protein, vitamins, and minerals. Of course, I've got to mention genetics because there is a heritability component on, in DODs. Um, perhaps larger breeds and more rapid growth increase the risk of DODs. Confirmation may increase the, increase the risk. And then of course, athletic ability, that is, that is affected by genetics. So the genetic component, as a nutritionist, I can't do much about, however, I can, no matter what the genetic component, we can feed the horse to achieve um, hopefully their genetic potential, whatever that potential is. Environment also has an effect on cell and growth and development. Confinement is really not ideal for young growing horses. In, um, in the States, it's, it's a, it's, it can be a problem because 
a lot of times uh, the breeding programs are set so that the babies are born very early in the year, January, February, March. And in some parts of the country, the weather's really terrible at that time of year and you wanna keep your babies inside, mamas and babies. Confinement can be a problem with sound growth and development. Uh, to some extent, forced exercise can be a problem. You don't want to press that young growing horse beyond what their skeletal structure and muscles are um, sound enough to, to support. So you need to find a balance. You don't want to confine. Mother nature has, you know, has babies basically running around outside. And there's some research that shows that the play exercise is good for growth and development. And some amount of exercise also helps the bones uh, remodel and get very sturdy and grow well. So you don't want to exercise them too hard. You also don't want them stuck in a stall. So in the middle with some exercise is a good place to be. I've got a little bit of research to, um, to, to talk about that later. Okay, so the foals are drinking mama's milk. And for about six to eight weeks after birth, nursing supplies 100% of the foals nutrient requirements. However, and the digestib digestibility of mare's milk is very high, about 98%. Thoroughbred foals drink an average of 14.7 kilograms of milk per day. So that is a lot of milk. And the frequency of nursing, they start out 10 times an hour, first day of nursing. So they're drinking a lot of mama's milk. As time goes on, that diminishes by the 17th week of nursing. They're only drinking about one and a half times an hour. So it's slowing down. And actually, mama's milk after this a few months, um, actually, probably by six weeks, the, the mare's milk may not be providing everything that the baby needs. So that's something to be aware of. In general, it is a good idea to provide some feed for the baby. There's not a problem with providing some feed for the baby you know, from, from birth. And a lot of these babies start nibbling on mama's feed. So, and that's really not a problem. A week old will spend about 8% of its day eating solid food. And by the time it's five months, it'll spend 73% of its day eating food. So not any problem to let baby nibble on mama's food. And uh, it's also a lot of times a good idea to provide a creep feed so that the baby is actually eating feed designed for it and a measured amount so that it's getting the, the nutrients that it needs. So when to begin feeding? Um, I, again, there's no problem with letting the feed eat from the time it st first starts being interested, but it will, it's, it will need supplemental feed by about 90 days. So creep feeding, uh, there is research showing that foals that have creep feed do have higher average daily gains and foals that are already accustomed to feed have lower weaning stress. If you think about it, when you wean a baby, there's so much stress. They're not with mama anymore. They're not getting any milk. And then all of a sudden, if on top of that, they have this, this bucket of, you know, grain or pellets or something they've never even been they're not used to it all, that's on top of all the other stress. Uh, anything you can do to reduce the stress of weaning is gonna be good for the baby. So creep feed is a, a very good idea. Uh, some of the advantages in some circumstances, uh, if you're not sure of the mare's milk production, if the mare is not letting the baby eat from her own feed, if you're looking for a higher desired growth rate, so the creep feed will support the nutrition to, um, to, to let the baby grow a little faster. And then if uh, pre-weaning desired adaptation to the post-weaning nutritional program. So again, you're adjusting the baby before you wean it into its new nutritional program. All these are reasons that creep feeding can be very helpful. Dr. Young, when yes. you talk about creep feeding, what exactly does that mean? 
<laughs> like, is it just introducing? That's a very good question. Yeah, just for people that might not know, including it is. <laughs> it is all. All it is is feeding a suckling. It's additional feeding of the suckling pole. It is providing a feed designed for babies. You can either feed with the mare. So, for instance, you have a three-month-old suckling foal. You've got a, you you're getting a feed that's designed for mares and babies, and you figure out. In general, the recommendation is feed one pound of creep feed per month of age of the baby. So if you've got a three-month-old baby, you're providing an additional three pounds of feed a day. So you may be adding that to the mare's feed. So if you feed the mare twice a day, she gets an extra pound and a half each meal. Or if the mare, if, if the mare won't let the baby eat, you may want to feed the baby separately. And some people have... Um, Basically, the, you can build a pen that the baby can get into and the mare can't, and you can feed the baby in that little pen so it can get to its feed by itself. And that's, if you can feed the baby separately from the mare, that's probably the best way so you know how much feed the baby is actually eating. So that's, that's all creep feeding is, is, is making sure the baby, the suckling baby is getting feed you know, for it. Perfect, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, feeding the weanling. So the most critical stage of growth, I've been mentioning DODs, but to prevent DODs, we really want to make sure we've got the feeding right from weaning to 12 months of age. That's when they are the most susceptible for these um, uh, developmental orthopedic disease or disorders. The skeleton is most vulnerable to disease at that point. And of course, this is when there, there's so much growth of the skeleton going on. Now, this is when monitoring the growth rate is vital. You do want, as I mentioned, that steady, smooth growth curve. So you don't have little peaks and valleys where the baby shoots up or then really slows down. You just want a nice, smooth growth curve. And you gotta look at different diet scenarios for different breeds. And actually, even within different individuals, because just like adult horses, there are some babies that are easy keepers, some babies that are harder keepers. So you got to be aware of that. Watch the body condition scoring and make sure that the baby is staying at an appropriate body condition score to make sure you try to avoid those the peaks and valleys. So the nutrients we're looking at, of course, energy, calories. You want to feed to meet the requirement and maintain that body condition score. Higher calorie intake promotes faster growth. And as I mentioned before, you want to watch the calories, but you also want to make sure protein, vitamins, and minerals are also there. Now, more specifically about protein. Horses don't have protein requirements per se. They actually have requirements for individual amino acids. Now, the amino acids are the building blocks for protein. So there are all these little specific amino acids and you put the amino acids all together and it's, it's almost like a string of beads and each little bead is a different amino acid or sometimes there's the same, but there's, there's all these little different amino acids that build a protein. Different dietary proteins contain different amino acid balances. And so the quality of the protein actually reflects how well the amino acids of that protein meet nutrient requirements for horses. That is one of the reasons in feeds you see a lot of soybean meal. Soybean meal is actually a, a very high quality plant protein for horses. So in formulating horse feeds, we, we rely quite a lot on soybean meal. So there are other protein sources. Alfalfa protein is a pretty decent quality. It's not, it's, it's missing some of the amino acids. Um, let's see, there are some other meals. Linseed meal is, a, is a, a pretty good quality protein. And then you get into some uh, protein sources that are really poor quality. They, so you can get a feed that is an appropriate percentage protein, but it really does not have the amino acids that we're looking for. 
So again, amino acids are the building blocks. There are essential amino acids. There's, there's about 20 amino acids total. And about half of those are essential in that those are amino acids that can't be synthesized by the body. So those amino acids, you probably all have heard of the amino acid lysine. That's just an amino acid, but it can't be synthesized in the body and it must be provided in the diet. So the limiting amino acids are the essential amino acids that are, the first limiting amino acid is the one that's probably most commonly in protein sources. That's the one that you're gonna run out of the first. And in horses, we know that lysine is the, is the first limiting amino acid. In pigs, man, those pig nutritionists have the amino acids down to such a precise science. They know, they really know where the amino acids need to be. In horses, we know lysine. And beyond lysine, we think the second and third amino, limiting amino acids are probably methionine and threonine, but that's not been defined by research. So in my little example, so you can understand amino acids, you remember the little magnetic letters that you may have had on the refrigerator. I, I came up with this little idea this morning to explain limiting amino acids. So let's say uh, you, you have this set of magnetic letters and you want to build yourself a protein. And the protein you want to build is actually Melissa from Mississippi. That's your protein. That's your string of amino acids and the letters are each amino acid. So your feed is this, you just ate this specific, um, I actually got this off Amazon. This is a magnetic letter set that you can buy from Amazon. And so you wanna build the protein from this that is Melissa from Mississippi. So you start going, okay, M, there's, there's an M, I'm good. There's an E, we're good. L, I, S, S, A, got Melissa down. From, okay, we're still good. We got from, oh, Mississippi. There's, well, we're cool. Uh, well, no, never mind. We're not cool. We ran out of M's because there were only two and we used the second one in from. So we have, we don't have another M. We got an I, we're good. We got two S's. Yep, we're still good. Oh, mm -mm. We just ran out of I's. So what you actually end up, we wanted to build Melissa from Mississippi and we ended up with Melissa from IP. Well, is that the same thing? If you were wanting to build a protein in a muscle of a young growing horse and our protein was Melissa from Mississippi, is Melissa from IP going to do the job? Maybe not. And if it doesn't do the job, we don't have, these are the amino acids we ate. We don't have any more amino acids. We could maybe pull some amino acids from other muscles, but what happens to that muscle? So we can run, really run into a problem. Now, what happens if, for instance, it's copper instead of amino acids here, we're just, we just need copper. What happens if there's not enough dietary copper and we're building, we're going from cartilage to bone and one of the essential enzymes requires copper and we ran out of copper. Well, we may have a problem in the bone structure. What if there's not enough vitamin E in the diet? Okay, we don't have antioxidants that help protect the muscle. What are we gonna do there? So that is why it's so important to make sure that the diet contains all of these nutrients to make sure that we're not trying to build a good muscle with Melissa from IP. Okay, so we're feeding these weanlings. We wanna make sure it's slow, we're promoting slow and steady growth. And for quarter horses, warm bloods, Arabs, ponies, heavy non-sale thoroughbreds, uh, a lot of times good quality pasture or high quality forage and a balancer pellet is going to get the job done. And of course, KER has all phase, which is an excellent balancer that's available. If we have poor quality hay or poor pasture, I'm sorry, if we have poor pasture available, we don't have the greatest, um, well, to, to make sure if we have poor, poor pasture and we don't have good, High, high quality grass, then we wanna come back with a good quality hay and a breeding feed to make sure the baby's getting what it needs. Now, if you're, you got, you got to push the growth rate for sales or you're getting ready for shows, that type of thing, um, then we wanna definitely start with very high quality forage 
And we probably want to add the, a breeding feed, you know, a feed that is designed for young growing horses. Or if, if you want to go the balancer route, you can use the balancer and add more calories because these, if you're pushing the growth rate, you do need more calories from grain, beet pulp, oil, or some other fat source. Um, in general, my recommendation would be a good quality uh, feed designed to be fed to young growing horses, whether that's a mare and foal feed or just a growth feed. And then of course, quality forage. Okay, talking about DODs. Uh, developmental orthopedic disease or developmental orthopedic disorders, is, that's a term used to describe a group of diseases that affect the skeleton of growing horses. So basically it's um, a skeletal or bone abnormality. And it often causes young horses to be removed for sales, sell below their value, and it certainly can affect their per performance potential. Uh, they include physitis, osteochondritis desiccans, which is commonly known as OCD, wobbler syndrome, and angular limb deformities. And all of these things are, they, they can, there can be a heritability component that the horse is more predisposed, uh, but that even if there's a heritability, Sometimes with nutrition, with proper nutrition, you can avoid or lower the risk of the horse uh, you know, developing one of this, this, these disorders. So physitis is inflammation of the growth plate, which is also known as epiphysitis or physeal dysplasia. And basically it happens when the, in the growth plate, when it is going from uh, kind of the, the cartilage to bone uh, is that is disrupted. And you can usually see it in the distal radius and tibia. And, and the, you can see a circle down around the fetlock, the distal at the end of the cannon bone. And the affected physes have a typical flared appearance. And sometimes it's called like uh, boxy uh, pasterns. Uh, it's often warm to the touch. Uh, with or without associated lameness. Some, sometimes you get this and they're not lame. Sometimes they can become very lame. And horses generally present between four and eight months of age. Now, most of these youngsters outgrow the condition as the bone remodels. And one of the first recommendations is to reduce the growth rate, slow the growth rate down. And of course, as I said before, you, you get the recommendation of really drastically cut the calories and pull out all the grain and such, but it's really important to make sure that you cut the calories, but keep the nutrition adequate to support healthy growth because you're slowing the growth rate, but you still want to support healthy growth. And this is just a picture of epiphysitis. And here we see um, up actually in the growth plate of, of the knees, so you can, you can get epiphysitis in either joint, but again, we wanna reduce the calories, but maintain a nice slow growth rate with uh, adequate nutrition to support healthy growth. Now, OCD, osteochondritis desiccans, is a disturbance in articular cartilage resulting in necrosis of thickened cartilage causing joint pressure, strain, and fissures in the damaged cartilage. And these are lesions. Sometimes they do resolve in time, but quite often they don't. Uh, there's, there's really not been enough radiographs going over time of, of individual young growing horses to get a good handle on how much of these are normal and resolve on their own. Because I believe there is some instances that if you uh, radiograph and see a small lesion and the same baby you radiograph a year or two and there's nothing, but that's not gonna happen because they're often, you know, not all babies are radiographed just across the board and nobody's going to do that. So there's a thought that sometimes this happens naturally and resolves, but if there's lameness and, um, or you're doing a pre-purchase exam on a little bit older horse, then it, it can really be an issue. 
can I take a pause and put my little dog in the backyard? Because she's really. Yes, no problem. I'll be right back. All right. Guys, while she is letting her dog out, if you have questions, feel free to comment during this video. Um, I'm kind of taking a look at, you know, the live comments as they come in. So if you have questions, you know, please type that in and, and I can try and ask her for you and get those answered. Oh, okay. <laughs> Livy is now in the backyard. She'll show up at the door again, wanting to be in and she's out of luck so okay she got no ocd lesion and uh it's diagnosed by lameness possibly swelling and radiographs they x-ray and they see this lesion they may consider sur surgery if the lesion is displaced and the surgical removal it really makes sense if there's an economic benefit of a clean joint versus the cost of the procedure in convalescence, because you know surgery is expensive, and then there's going to be a, a period of recuperation. So you just have to balance uh, if it's worth doing the surgery, or if it's a better idea to again back off the growth rate and see if it it can be resolved naturally. So factors that contribute to DOD, of course, first genetics. Can't do anything about genetics, but we can try and provide proper nutrition to minimize the risk, even if there is genetic predisposition. One thing I wanna mention is that um, there, is, there, there was a survey done and they, they looked at DODs in feral horses. And I believe they came up with about 12% of the, the young, you know, growing wild horses actually show DODs. So there is apparently a genetic component and there are some breeding farms that feel that it's important to get to zero DODs. But when we look in, in nature and 12% of the growing horses with DODs, we're probably getting to zero is probably not realistic. But again, nutrition can certainly help reduce the risk. The environment is something to manage and going along with that, just general management of young growing horses. Injury certainly can predispose to developing more DODs and stress, mechanical stress can, can lead to uh, DODs in young growing horses. So one of the things that we do see is the ir irregular growth rate can increase the risk of DODs which is fluctuating growth rates with periods of slow or decreased growth followed by growth spurts. I've got dog hair all over me. This is just fun. Um, so again, we want to have that smooth growth curve. So non-uniform growth rates can occur due to dietary and environmental stress in puberty. When the horse goes through pu puberty, puberty, you might see a dip or a peak in the, the uh, the growth rate. So as I keep mentioning, the pattern of slow early growth is more appropriate for foals to redu reduce the risk of DODs and the, to support the healthiest bone uh, development and muscle development in the young growing horse. So delaying the rapid growth until after this window of vulnerability for bone and joint disease, which is in general, the first 12 months of age, if we can keep the growth rate a little bit slower and smoother during that period of time, that may really help reduce the risk of the young horse developing DODs. So how does nutrition play a role in the pathogenesis of DOD in horses? Well, deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, nutrient excesses and nutrient imbalances can all increase the risk of, of DODs. So for instance, mineral deficiency or excess. We know that a deficiency or excess of the major bone and cartilage forming minerals, which would be calcium, phosphorus, copper, and zinc, if you have too much, not enough, or even imbalances of those minerals, you can increase the risk of DODs. In general, horses can tolerate fairly high level of minerals. They're 
you, it, it, ta it takes a lot to get to you know, a, a toxic or an overload of most of the minerals. Um, however, excess calcium, phosphorus, iodine, fluoride, and heavy metals uh, such as lead and cadmium may lead to DOD. There's, there's not a lot of controlled research. Calcium and phosphorus there is, of course, but the other minerals, there's not a lot, but there is some indication that those can lead to DOD. So uh, there was some research uh, that was published in the 2007 NRC that calcium fed at 300% above the daily requirement may lead to secondary mineral deficiencies because the minerals interact with each other. So if you get too much of one mineral that actually may inhibit another mineral. We do know with calcium and phosphorus, there is that relationship. And in general, we recommend about a two to one calcium phosphorus ratio in the total diet, because if you get too much calcium, it will inhibit the absorption of phosphorus. And actually, if you get more phosphorus in the diet than calcium, the phosphorus then will inhibit the calcium. So you can get calcium or phosphorus deficiencies that are caused by the other mineral. So it's really important to be aware of what the relationships are with the minerals. So again, in the NRC, it was reported that this very high level of calcium actually interfered with the absorption of the phosphorus, zinc, and iodine. So another scenario is inappropriate, um, inappropriate grain choice or inadequate fortification in grain. So you're growing a young horse and for instance, you feed this young growing horse a, a grain that's designed for maintenance horses. That's not gonna have the nutrients to support the growth in the, in the baby. And actually I see this more often with people that are feeding something uh, like an all stock. Every, every feed store has got all stock feeds, but the problem with an all stock is if it's designed for instance, if, it, if it's a, a feed that's safe to feed to your sheep, then it does not provide enough copper to meet any horse's requirements because copper, sheep are very intolerant of copper. So there's really no such thing as all stock. There is not a feed that will meet all, the cre all critters needs. Um, it's just a feed that's not gonna kill anything. And if you're growing a horse, you want a feed that's gonna support the growing horse. Another time you're gonna see this is if a, a horse owner is feeding a straight cereal grain with no additional vitamin or mineral mix or even a ration balancer added to it. Cereal grains are great ingredients in feeds, but they're not balanced feeds on their own. They're, they don't have adequate amino acids. They're missing out on some vitamins and minerals. So they're good ingredients. They're not a balanced feed. Uh, feeding a premixed feed or a commercial feed below the recommended intake. I've seen this a lot of times. The recommended intake is, for instance, four pounds minimum per day for a thousand pound horse, and someone is feeding, you know, one pound a day. That's not getting all the protein, vitamins, and minerals that that, that animal needs. Another one is feeding a commercially prepared uh, feed and diluted with straight cereal grains. I see this a lot. You buy a bag of feed and then cut it half and half with oats. Oats are a good ingredient. They're not a balanced feed. If you all you're doing with the oats is basically diluting out the nutrition and possibly imbalancing the nutrition of the balanced horse feed. If you mix something that's balanced with something else that's balanced, you're probably going to be okay if you kind of know what you're doing and the nutrients are similar between the two feeds. My, I have a 34 year old who's decided he didn't like what he was eating. And so now I'm mixing two feeds, but they have similar nutrients. They just have very different tastes. So when you're 34 and still giving lessons and jumping, you get to eat whatever you want as long as, as it's nutritional and appropriate. So all of these errors in this situation can be actually corrected by feeding a concentrate balancer with concentrated protein, vitamins, and minerals that's designed to be fed in a very small amount. 
and it will help balance out the nutritional holes of all of, the, all of these scenarios. Okay, I mentioned mineral imbalances because the ratio uh, in a couple slides ago, but the ratio of minerals to one another is as important as the actual amount of individual minerals in the ration. So I talked about calcium to phosphorus. You never want more phosphorus than calcium in the total diet. So it should never dip below a one-to-one -one ratio. And ideally 1.5 to one, two to one, uh, in research, it's, they've been fed six to one calcium to phosphorus to young growing horses. And as long as the phosphorus was adequate to meet the requirements, even six to one wasn't a problem, but never less than one to one. And I wouldn't get too far beyond six to one because then, then you have the calcium that can inhibit the phosphorus. Now, the ideal ratio of zinc to copper actually has not been defined. However, you got to meet the requirements, and the zinc requirement for a total diet is 40 parts per million, and copper requirement is 10 to 15 parts per million in the total diet. And we do know that copper and zinc can actually affect one another's absorption. So you don't want to go wildly and you wouldn't want to feed a diet that you know is a thousand parts per million zinc and 10 parts per million copper. So you want to kind of be within the range to meet those requirements and you wouldn't want to feed a diet. I don't know how you would, but um, feeding a diet that's higher in copper, in copper than zinc is really not going to be a good idea either. Now, the best method of diagnosing mineral deficiencies, excesses, and imbalances is actually through a ration evaluation. And that's just going through the ration and figuring out what exactly is in the forage for your young growing horse and what's in the feed and making sure that the nutrients are all available in the right amounts and the right balances to meet that young horse's demands. There, there's a lot of marketing on blood analysis, hair analysis, hoof analysis in figuring out like uh, there's a hair analysis for mineral uh, deficiencies, um, blood analysis for a lot of these things. There are some nutrients that you actually can measure in blood analysis, but it's limited uh, efficiency. Hair analysis for minerals, that's really been proven to be uh, really inaccurate. So I, I don't recommend, I don't know that there's ever been an instance where I have recommended a hair analysis for minerals. And hoof analysis, you might get some information, but again, the best thing to do is look at the ration, evaluate the ration, you may even have forages and feeds analyzed so you know exactly how much and what the concentration of those nutrients are getting into the young growing horse to make sure that the, the ration is appropriate. So some feeding practices that contributed to DOD, overfeeding, just uh, rapid growth rate. And usually that's overfeeding. Uh, well, if you overfeed to make a baby fat, you're in increasing the rate of DODs. So, you don't want fat babies. You don't want skinny babies. You want to keep them right. As I said, a body condition score five. Larger foals growing fast are more likely to develop OCD lesions and inflammation of the growth plates. Uh, there was some research in the in cell Francais breed, French trotters and thoroughbreds. And then hawk and stifle OCDs tend to occur in heavier foals, indicating in these cases that biomechanical forces are probably involved just stress on the developing bone and joints that can lead to OCDs. So avoid overfeeding. There's, there's no simple role, rules about how, great, how much grain is too much, but watch the body condition score. Forage availability and quality will dictate the amount of grain required. If you've got good quality forage and a lot of it, you're probably not gonna feed a lot of additional calories and that's when you might want a balancer. A ration evaluation can be very helpful. Um, to reduce total intake of calories, maybe you wanna look at a grass hay over alfalfa because grass hay tends to be lower in calories. A balancer pellet instead of a complete fortified feed. 
and regularly weigh and body condition scored the young stock. Ideally, as I mentioned, you want to just see, barely see the outline of the last two ribs on weanlings and yearlings. High protein intake is not a factor in DODs. That is a myth that just kind of hangs on. A lot of breeders are concerned about protein level in the feed related to DOD, but it's, it's really, it's not, protein's not an issue. So uh, energy, too many calories without enough protein can be an issue, but too much protein's not an issue. So, and this is just some research on looking at energy versus protein, and it shows that protein is, is not an issue in DODs. Again, excessive calories are linked to DODs. So, we also want in reducing the risk of DODs in, through nutrition, we wanna make sure we're uh, taking care of the broodmare nutrition. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we need to be feeding the fetus from the time the fetus is conceived. We wanna monitor the growth rates. We wanna make sure they have balanced nutrition during growth. There is a thought that a very high glycemic feed may increase the risk of DODs in these young growing horses. And that's a feed that's very high in starch and sugar. Um, so that's something to be aware of. If you have a horse that is predetermined, especially through genetics, to be at risk for DODs, then maybe not feed something that's very high sugar starch. Um, for instance, the uh, corn, something that's very high in corn may be too much starch for a young growing horse. Okay, now let's talk quickly about feeding the yearling. Because once ho the horse reaches 12 months, it's less likely to develop DOD. It's not impossible, but it's less likely. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that if you need to kind of push the growth rate, it's a little bit less risky to push the growth rate a bit once the baby is a yearling. And uh, lesions that are clinically relevant as, as yearlings are typically formed at a younger age. We still wanna make sure that we have correct nutri nutrient balance but we can, there's been research indicating that you can push the growth, the growth rate some at this age, as long as you need to increase the calories, but also increase the protein, vitamins, and minerals to support the, the faster growth rate. And again, growth monitoring is still very important, especially if we're trying to push the growth rate for sales prep. Um, you know, a lot of times you want in, in some, well, for instance, the halter horse industry, they want these young babies just really big. They actually want to see them kind of fat. So it is less risky to push the growth rate with high calories as long, again, as you've got the protein, vitamins, and minerals to support it. Now, if clinical DOD is already evident, then we don't want to be pushing the growth rate. We want to manage nutrition, slow the growth rate, and make sure we give the baby a chance to, to try and correct some of these DODs. Uh, I always thought this is very interesting. This is from some research that's a little dated now, but still good research because uh, at this time, there were a lot of horses that were being fed, a lot of growing horses that were fed alfalfa, hay, and oats. And that was thought to be a really good uh, diet for young growing horses. And so in this research, Pete Gibbs and some, some others fed alfalfa, hay, and oats versus alfalfa, hay, and a blended balanced grain mix. And what they saw, the horses on the blended grain mix grew taller and the horses on oats grew fatter. What does that tell us? Remember uh, my uh, Melissa from Mississippi? Well, Melissa, we couldn't build Melissa from Mississippi with on the oats and alfalfa because they didn't, that diet didn't have all of the nutrients needed and so when it got to Melissa from Is, it, it, the diet did not support. So instead of continuing to grow taller and developing muscle and bone, well, it just got fatter. So it, when energy is provided for growth, but it's not fortified with proper amino acids, vitamins, and minerals to support that healthy growth, the calories are converted to fat instead of fueling development of muscle and bone. So. We wanna have all the nutrients. Boy, I've said that many times now. 
So the moral of this story is make sure the nutrients are there. Okay, some other yearling feeding considerations. Colts may need more calories than fillies. They, they just tend to have higher energy requirements for their activity. Uh, with good spring grass, be careful not to overfeed because that's very nutrient and calorie rich. Um, but I say nutrient rich, but it's still even good spring grass is, is missing in some amino acids and could be some minerals. So a balancer pellet is helpful there. For sales or show prep, increase caloric intake, but again, monitor that body condition score, quality forage, alfalfa hay. And then in these cases, they need more calories. So you can probably feed a good quality breeding feed at appropriate amounts possibly plus um, oil, beet pulp, or other fat source if needed, but usually just the breeding feed and the alfalfa or good quality forage is, is the, the best diet to, to push the growth rate there for the yearlings. So maximizing bone development, I'm just gonna kind of, it's, it's really important. Um, the maximum bone mineral content is not achieved until six years. So and now this is this can be a little bit different with different breeds, but in general, so make sure that all of the nutrients are provided the entire time that that horse is growing. Because as I said, way back at the beginning, you can't go back and, and fix it once they're done growing. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier about confinement. Confinement may be a contributing factor to um, growth, extra, to bone development, to healthy bone development. Horses were built to travel and move frequently. Stalled horses lose bone mineral content and bursts of speed coupled with consistent movement is important. And actually there's some studies that have shown that play can facilitate proper skeletal growth in young horses. Also, however, Forced exercise also can help increase bone mass. So free choice exercise is great. And in some situations, if free choice exercise is not available or not, uh, if, if they're not getting that, that exercise, forced exercise may be very helpful to increase the bone mass. Um, Rob et al. in 89 did some research that showed weanlings that underwent forced exercise up to yearling age had increased cannon bone mass when compared to non-exercised horses. And Firth et al., more recently in 2011, saw thoroughbred weanlings controlled sprint exercise plus free pasture exercise associated with increased chond chondrocyte viability and bone size and strength. And then in 2012, Firth et al. saw in many cases, the positive effect persisted throughout subsequent two and three-year-old racing. So exercise is very helpful and important for these developing bones. There is some recent KER bone density research in weanlings and yearlings. So there was a pilot study of 27 weanlings raised on a breeding farm in Kentucky that showed a small drop in bone density of 5% during the winter months. And you think about winter months, you know, that's they're, they're inside, they're not doing as much. And so the bone mineral density in these horses subsequently increased during the spring as self-exercise increased. So that was a pilot study. And the second study uh, done by KER, they uh, added triactin to the diet of the thoroughbred weanlings to see if that would affect some of the measures of bone density or size. So they added the triactin and they had a control group that were on a balanced weanling ration but did not get the triactin. And then they looked at radiographs of the cannon bone. They measured total bone diameter and cortical width. And these are just, I'm not going to spend any time on these, but this is the, they measured the bone density in the radiographs. And what they actually saw was that in, I've got in bold, the control horses averaged a 5.9 decrease in density, while the triactin supplemented horses showed a 4.6% increase in density. I don't know where the increase in density went to on my slide, but so actually supplementing with the triactin that has the, the vitamins and especially the minerals and some protein to support the bone growth, instead of dropping in, den in density, bone density, they actually increased in density, 
which just shows you that supplementing with the appropriate nutrients really helps in bone development and growing horses. So when you get to two years plus, then you wanna to continue to support the growth demands plus feed for performance expectations. So you gotta remember babies are still growing and oh, they're not babies anymore. Now they're two-year-olds and three-year-olds. They are still growing, but you're also starting to work them. They're, they're, that's even more stress on, on the bones and muscles. So you wanna make sure you're getting adequate calories for their growth and their workload. And then along with that, a feed or a balancer, and the choice depends on the forage quality and individual animal metabolism. Y'all know easy keeper versus hard keeper. So if it's a harder keeper, an average keeper, and they're growing and working, you're probably gonna be feeding them a feed. And if they're an easy keeper, you may be feeding a balancer and you may be feeding a, a supplement such as Duraplex, or as I man mentioned, Triactin, which are both uh, designed and fortified to provide those uh, bioavailable minerals and other nutrients to support optimal bone growth and development in these horses. And of course, protein, amino acids to meet the demands again for growth as well as um, exercise uh, for these young horses entering training. So in conclusion, nutrition for growth, slow steady growth is important for skeletal soundness and the growth of the young equine athlete must be carefully managed. You wanna adjust energy intake accordingly, do not overfeed. Forage is the foundation of all young horses' diets. Uh, remember adequate quality protein and then a ba balanced vitamin and mineral intake. So the take home message, maintain that balance between energy needs and other nutrient requirements, that steady growth rate with a smooth growth curve and proper nutrition for healthy growth starts before birth. Then keep on with the balanced nutrients, a steady growth rate for healthy growth and development throughout their entire growth phase from birth up until five, six years. And for the older growing horses, feed to support growth and their performance. And finally, the KER March promotion, uh, just in the general, well, this is not March, sorry, September promotion, I should change that slide. The September promotion, digestive products are 15% off. So if you wanna order a digestive supplement or a digestive product, use the code GUT, G-U-T, 921. And as always, there's a WPRA member discount of 10% off of the KER products, which is WPRA 21. And thank you for your time. If you have, I'm happy to answer some questions and always remember that you've got a great resource in KER and you can go to KER.com and ask questions. You can call, we're more than happy to help you figure out what's the right way to feed your horse. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Young. I think that was a lot of really important information. And, you know, who would have thought that, you know, it starts way before and goes, you know, so far through their, you know, development. Um, you talked about, you know, feeding them well through their growth, you know, period. And I wasn't quite sure, was it the whole six years or where's the most important when we're talking about not, um, you know, making sure they grow to their fullest potential and things like that? Well, it kind of depends on where, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, I would say the most critical time to feed to reduce the risk of DODs is during that first 12 months. That's when the bones are really, remember how, how much and how fast they're growing in those first 12 months. So that time is really critical, but quite honestly, uh, beyond then, they're not growing as fast. The growth rate really slows down after the first 12 months, but they are still growing. They are still, uh, the bone is remodeling. It basically demineralizes and remineralizes. And this is during the time that you're really starting to, to start working them. And this is something that's kind of shown, that's been shown in young thoroughbred racehorses right about the time the growing horses are hitting their first really hard workouts 
is about the time that they're in a period of bone um, remodeling. And so they may be working really hard and the bone is in a lower mineralized state. So, and, and these may be, you know, yearling to two-year-olds. So it's critical to, during the first 12 months to reduce the risk of DODs, but to maintain healthy bones, um, the, the yearling to two-year-old year is also, a lot of things can go wrong then. And then until they're done growing, which is usually at about five or six, you still want to make sure that your horse isn't getting too fat, your horse isn't getting too thin, and they are getting all of the protein, vitamins, and minerals that they need to support both the growth, even though at that point it may be just very slow growth, you still need to support it as well as the performance because you don't ever want that growing horse not to be getting the nutrients it needs. Perfect. And then when you talk about like the nutrient requirements for a young horse, how do we know what those are? Or is there a good place for us to find those to make sure, you know, when we're looking at our ration to see if it's balanced and things like that? Um, yeah, what's the best place to find that information for our young horses? Um, I would like to say there is one resource you can go to and that will tell you everything you need, but that's that's why there are equine nutritionists because it does get, it can get very complicated. Um, of course, as I mentioned, KER, we're, we're happy to help people. Um, you can go to an equine nutritionist. Uh, so a lot of the feed companies do have equine nutritionists that will help you out with figuring out where you need to be. And quite honestly, um, the KER partners the feed companies that use the research and the nutritionists at KER to put together their feeds, those feeds are actually balanced to provide the nutrients when you feed them as recommended. Uh, KER does have some feed products. There are some supplements. All Phase is a really good vitamin mineral supplement. And um, I'm sorry, All Phase is the, is the ration balancer. And the, it's, it's got the protein, vitamins, and minerals that is, is just a very good way to use um, on its own for the easier keepers or to bump up the nutrition if you need it for a little bit harder keepers. Uh, there, are, there are some feed products from KER. They're not as available as the KER partners, but if you go with a really reputable company that provides good balanced feeds, uh, you're usually in pretty good shape. But again, go to KER, you can talk to a nutritionist or one of the nutrition consultants or one of the KER partners to get on a good feeding program. Awesome. And then, you know, we talked about monitoring their growth and making sure it's not too fast or too slow. Um, is body condition score basically the best way to be monitoring that? Would you ever be monitoring like their weight, you know, their growth rate in weight terms? And would you, yeah, yeah how would you be measuring that? If how you, <laughs> if, uh, you can get a body, a body weight tape, the scale of course is the best way, but you can use a body weight tape and you can also measure um, wither height, this, the height of the baby. And you can plot those, um, plot the weight, and the, 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 the growth, just the growth in height. And in some research studies, they actually also measure uh, the height at the hip. But if you really wanna get scientific and, and plot these things and make a graph of uh, daily gain, and then, or I don't know if you wanna use a body weight tape every day, if you're doing it yourself, if, if you use a body weight tape consistently, like every week and measure the height, every week and you can plot your own curve and watch it and make sure. But quite honestly, for myself, I usually use the body condition scoring more than anything else. And that with my own horses, whether they're growing or not, pretty much every time I see them, which is almost daily, I'm checking that body condition score and making sure that they're not gaining weight, losing weight, that they're staying at the same body condition score 
and I'm adjusting their diets as needed and bumping up a little bit, bumping down a little bit, just to make sure they're staying at the appropriate body condition score. And that's the same thing I recommend for people dealing with the young growing horses. Perfect. Well, I think that's all the questions that I had. Um, guys, if you have questions, feel free to, you know, do a quick comment. If there's some that I missed, you know, for any reason, you can always message the WPRA Facebook page or the Kentucky Equine Research Facebook page, and we'd be happy to get you answers. Um, don't forget about the WPRA member discount, which is WPRA 21. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Young. Well, thank you. It's been great. Sorry. Sorry, my <laughs> dog was such an annoying. <laughs> she just wanted to be part of the podcast too. So it's fine. <laughs> Apparently.